Of God. Happy Sabbath to you. I pray that God's richest blessings will be yours. And I hope that as we come to worship Him today, that our worship may not be in vain, but that we would understand what's His will for our lives and that we would allow His Holy Spirit to lead us into the paths of righteousness. Today, the Lord has given to us a word, and it's the title, Freedom. And I do pray and hope that as we look into God's words, we would understand how the power of God's salvation brings freedom to those who have accepted his salvation. So before we get into the word, let's just bow our heads as we pray. Our Father and our God, we're so happy that you brought us into your courts to worship you today. We thank you, dear Lord, that you have seen it fit to lengthen the brickly cords of our lives so that we could come and worship you unmolested. Lord, we're so grateful for your many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And so as we come today, our hearts are filled to overflowing with your love. And so we just want to magnify you because of who you are. Dear Lord, as we're about to go into your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead, guide, and direct. So that as your words go forth, it will find a lodging place in the hearts of your people. And that we would recognize that great sacrifice that you made for us is for all of us who come to you to be saved. Thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done, because we ask all these blessings in your son's most precious name. Amen. Freedom. The next few minutes, I will attempt to show you that when we accept the power of God's salvation, it brings us freedom. Freedom from three different things. Number one, freedom from the penalty of sin. That's number one. Number two, freedom from the power of sin. And number three, freedom from the very presence of sin. Just keep these three things in mind that the power of God's salvation brings to us. You see, the Bible tells us in John chapter 8, the gospel according to John chapter 8 and verse 34. Here we find Jesus speaking to his disciples and to all those who were in the sound of his voice so that they could hear. He was letting them know that it is very important as a people that they should understand the truth of the gospel and the truth that he brought to them. Because the truth that he brought was to make them free. And people are being enslaved because of sin. And so we see here, sin brings slavery. Sin has us in bondage. But here Jesus is saying, to everyone in verse 34 of John chapter 8. Notice what he says here. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Sin controls all those who commit sin. But here's the problem. Since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, all men are sinners and we should have received the wages of sin, which is death. Isn't that so? According to Romans chapter six and verse 23. Once we were born 
We are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And our very tendencies that we have is to do sinful things because that's our nature. But when the Apostle Paul speaks about the wages of sin is death, he's saying that this death penalty is not the first death. Because we recognize that in Adam all die. Saints and sinners alike, we all die. Isn't that so? Everyone dies. But what Paul is speaking about, this wage that we're going to receive for sins, he is speaking about the second death. So when he says the wages of sin is death, he's saying that the, when we live in sin and we die in sin, the penalty that we will receive is second death. And when we die that second death, that is because we're eternally lost. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I want us to look at something here quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, sorry, and verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22 it says for as in Adam how many of us die all die even so in Christ all shall be made alive so when we accept Christ we now become alive because we have been brought back from death to life this is why the Bible reminds us Jesus Christ came so that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Thank God for the second Adam who came and stood in our place and died the death that we should die so that we all can be free from sin today. We are so happy for God's gift to mankind. This death that we should have died. None of us can escape it without accepting Jesus. This is why God has given to us this wonderful promise, which is found in the book of Isaiah 55 and verse 7. Isaiah 55 and verse 7. Look at what the prophet Isaiah says here. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. When God makes a promise, he's never known to fail. When you come to him and you bring your sins to him, he is going to pardon your sins. But you must come with a contrite heart, having godly sorrow for sin. You see, transgression placed the whole world in jeopardy under the death sentence. But in heaven, there was heard a voice saying, I have found a ransom. I have found someone who will pay for your sins. You see, it is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that we can find that ransom. No wonder why the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. He says, Likewise you also reckon or consider ourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to god in christ jesus 
our Lord, when we come to Christ and we accept his sacrifice of sin, we must become dead to sin and alive in God. This is why Christ died to save us from the penalty of sin. And when we accept his salvation, he gives us the power to live for God. In speaking to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy, notice something here that the Apostle Paul said to his young preacher Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And notice verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the what? The promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Here is where we have eternal life only in Jesus and Jesus alone. No one else can give to us eternal life. This is why Jesus Christ came and he died for us. Jesus tells us in John chapter 11 and verse 25. John chapter 11 and verse 25. Here, Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Even though we die and we have accepted Jesus, this first death is nothing. But if we do not accept Christ, and we die in our sins, we are eternally lost. So Jesus is saying, accept my salvation so that you can escape what was meant for the enemy, which is eternal death. Sin separates us from God. And because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, he alone can give us everlasting life. My dear brothers and sisters, we need not follow man. No man on earth can save you. This is why it is so important for us to read study and understand the words of God. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds so we can get a good understanding of what God wants us to do. It is only the truth of God that can save us. And as we studied in our Sabbath school lesson this morning, when we worship God, we must worship him in spirit and in truth because God is particular. It doesn't matter how much people speak about buying your soul out of purgatory. It is impossible. It is only the blood of Jesus that can save us. John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 40. Jesus reminds us of something he says and this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life and i will do what raise him up at the last day jesus came to save us from sin from the penalty of sin no wonder why the apostle paul was so adamant here in romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. Let's look at what the Apostle Paul said here. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. He says, For to be what? 
carnally minded is death. In other words, what he's saying, to be fleshy minded brings death because when we're thinking in the flesh, what we have done, we have excluded the things of God from our thought process. So what he's saying here, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When we think about the things that are good, what things that God wants us to think about, it brings joy, it brings hope, it brings peace. This is what Paul speaks about in Galatians, where he speaks about the fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, hope, because we're thinking about things that are spiritual. Our minds, our thoughts are fixed and focused on Jesus. But when we are carnally minded, we are wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in the things of this world. And the things of this world cannot bring us eternal life. All that the things of this world brings to us is chaos, problems, trouble on every hand. This is what the world has to offer. But if you want peace and if you want joy, you need to let Jesus come into your life. It is only Jesus alone who can save us. No wonder why the Bible tells us, great peace have day with love thy law and nothing shall offend them. When Jesus lives in our heart, we have peace like a river and joy in our soul. Because the author and the source of every good thing resides in us. Very important, my brothers and sisters, that we understand that Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. Why not accept him? Why not lay hold on his precious promises, trust in him, because when we trust in him, he will never fail us. Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 and 8, it says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the death of Christ upon the cross has paid the price, the penalty of sin. So when we accept his salvation, we are free from the penalty of sin. Number two, the power of sin. And I want to thank Sister Jen for reading to us our scripture reading today, which is found in the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. It says, because the carnal mind, or in other words, because the fleshy mind is enmity, it's against God, for it is not subject to the what? To the law of God, nor indeed it can be. If you're against someone, this means you're not in agreement, you are in opposition. This is what he's saying. So he's, Paul continues on by saying, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It is impossible for us to please God because we do not know how to please God, only how. We can know how to please God is to get connected to him and he will teach us how to. If God pardon a man for the sins of the past and did not save him from the power of sin, then man would live forever as an everlasting sinner. So when God pardons us, we need not go back into the past. He expects and he demands action from us. God will not permit this to happen that we become everlasting sinners. That is why sinful man 
was driven from the tree of life lest he should eat and live forever as found in Genesis chapter 3 verses 22 and 23. My brothers and sisters, it is not enough just to have a knowledge of the effect of sin. What we need is the strength to move towards God who can forgive our sins and save us. When the spirit speaks to us, he expects us to move. Move towards the harbor of safety because the spirit of God, it will not always strive with man. And we do not know when God is going to call us home. This is why it is so important when we hear the voice of the Lord, we need not harden our hearts, but we need to move towards God. Do you sense a great need of power in your life? Do you recognize that something is missing? Do you believe that as the Spirit speaks to you and tell you this is the part that you need to go, that you, you should be procrastinating or no? You might be saying, I don't have the power to move forward. There are things that I need to get done. And I don't believe I can make it if I take that step. But God has the power to relieve you of those things. This is why God will supply you with much needed power so that you can live for him. This is why we need to understand that we can do all things, not something, but all things through Christ who strengthened us. Through the new birth experience, God gives the power of the new life. Let me show you how he, he does that. Salvation, as I said to you in the beginning, the power of salvation frees us from the power of sin. We can't remain the same way when the Holy Spirit gets into our lives. The book of John, John chapter 1, John 1 and verse 13. Tells us, let's start at verse 12. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power, to them gave he the right to become children of God, to those who believe on his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. Notice here, flesh has to get out of the way. Nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. It is God's will that causes that new creation in us. And little Demos could not understand this. So, Nicodemus, we know he was one of the religious leaders at the time of Christ. He believed what Jesus was preaching. And so he went to Jesus at night on the covers because he didn't want his other folks to see him going to Jesus. But there is nothing to be ashamed of when it comes to the gospel. And Jesus told Nicodemus, in John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the what spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's so important that we have to follow the Holy Spirit's leading. It is the Spirit of God that draws us to Christ. It is God's Holy Spirit that tells us we need a savior. It is God's Holy Spirit that helps us to be victorious over sinful tendencies that we tend to have in our lives. 
All we have to do is to give them all to Jesus. This is why the Apostle Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. He says, when we accept Christ, look, look at what happens. He says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, or in other words, perishable seed, or incorruptible or imperishable. This is what he's saying to the word of God, which lives and abides for how long? Forever. So when we accept Jesus and we accept his words, his words li should live and abide in us forever. The word of God will always remain and will always be true. The things of this world is just but for a fleeting moment. But the things of God last forever. What would it profit you, my dear brothers and sisters, if all that you're fighting for is for the things of this world, which is only temporal? Things that are going to fade away. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It cannot save you in the judgment. Only thing that can save you is the blood of Jesus and you accepting his sacrifice. There is nothing worth holding on to and letting go of Jesus. To be born again means that God fulfill his law in us. Let me repeat it. To be born again means that God fulfill his law in us. And God's law is all about love. Love to me and love to your fellow men. And because we love God, we're going to do what he asks of us. No wonder why. The Apostle Peter reminds us again in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Look at what he says here in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk how? According to the flesh, but according to the spirit. When we come to God, we have to die to self. We cannot let sin continue to reign in our mortal bodies. We have to let go and let God have his way. And in your spare time, I want you to take a look at the, the eighth, ninth, and tenth chapter of Hebrews. It's very important that you read those chapters and you will understand something here in these three chapters that I just mentioned. You will recognize what Christ is doing in heaven for you and what happened in the earthly sanctuary and what Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary. And it will show you that animal sacrifice, sacrifices could not do, but thank God for the ultimate sacrifice that he has provided for us, that is in Jesus. So my brothers and sisters, we too can have power over sin. Sin does not have to dominate us. You see the process of sin was reversed when God created a new creature in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. The Apostle Paul tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation or is a new creature. He didn't say some things. He said all things, your past life, all things have passed away and all things have become new. What Christ has done here when we come to him, he exalts us from the depths of sin, from the mire of sin, those things that held us in bondage. He has now relieved us of those things. So when we come to Christ, we are no more the person that we used to be. The things I used to do, what happens? I do them no more because there has been a great change since I was born. This change doesn't come from below, but this change comes from above. Only Jesus can save us. Not only does he recreate the sinner, but he has made wonderful provision for all who believe. You see, Jesus just doesn't save us and leave us there. He's a complete savior. Look at what he does. Look, continue. Second Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15. Second Corinthians 9 and verse 15. Let's look at what he does. This is what Paul is saying. Because of all that Jesus has done for us, we need to do what? Shout praises to him. It should be on our lips. Thanks be to God for his what? Indescribable gift. We cannot start to describe how wonderful that gift of Jesus Christ is. It is beyond our human comprehension for us to understand. Best we can do is to give our, our lives to him a life of service. Let's look at some of the things that God wants us to understand. In the book of Acts, chapter 5, Acts chapter 5 and verse 31, Acts chapter 5 and verse 31. This is what Jesus is doing for us. He says, him God has done what? Exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Jesus gives repentance for our sins. Repentance cannot be found in the heart where Jesus has not been at work. We cannot do it without his Holy Spirit. It is impossible for us to do that work without his Holy Spirit. No wonder why in the book of John chapter 16 and verse 8, Jesus makes it pollutively clear where he says, and when, speaking about the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that draws us to Christ, tells us we need to get our life fixed up. We need to have power over sin. Not only that, he sends his Holy Spirit, not only to fix us up, but to abide with us forever and to dwell in our hearts. Look at what John continues on by saying in 1 John. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 24. I'm so happy that we serve a God who is giving to us that power when we accept his salvation over sin because it is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, who is working on our behalf. First John chapter 3 and verse 24 tells us, Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given to us. John was with Jesus, and he's telling us we must keep 
his commandment to abide in him. Not only does he send his Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts and abide in us, he gives us all that we need so that this could happen. In Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. Look at what he says here. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. He provides the Bible to comfort, strengthen, and keep us. No wonder why the psalmist David reminds us in Psalm 119 verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto our part. Here is where we have the power over sin. When the Holy Spirit dwells in our heart and we read the word and we trust God and we follow his word, then we have the power to walk the straight and narrow way. I want to share with you also something personal. Give me a moment. Ephesians chapter 6. This pandemic has really done a number on me. I fast the best when I am around people. I need to be in the middle. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 17, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Here's what he's telling us to do. And take the helmet and salvation. And what else we need to take? The sword of the spirit, which is the what? The word of God. The word of God. Very, very important for us to have power over sin. So when we accept God's power of salvation, we must accept the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The word of God brings truth. In John chapter 17 and verse 17, it reminds us, sanctify them what? By thy truth, thy word is truth. So we are sanctified. We're sanctified, we're set apart. By the word of truth, we cannot know truth unless we know Jesus. This is why he reminds us when Jesus was praying there, he prayed for himself. In John 17 and verse 3, he says, And this is life eternal, that ye may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The result of knowing God and having a relationship with him gives us power over sin. And when we accept Jesus and we live for him, and he gives us that power over sin as we live in, look at what he does for us. Look at what he does for us. This is exciting news today, brothers and sisters. He opens heaven to our prayer. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. And when he opens heaven to a prayer, he is opening the ultimate source of power. Hebrews 4 and verse 16 tells us, let us therefore do what? Come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If we need power over sin, go to the throne of grace. Go to the source. God has unlimited power. We cannot exhaust his power. This is why he has opened up all of heaven all of heaven, my dear brothers and sisters, is at our disposal. No wonder why the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God did not hold nothing back. He will not hold nothing back in order for us to be victorious in this life, brothers and sisters. If there is anything else that God can do to save us, he will. 
God is not reserved when it comes to saving his children. He gives to us all. Remember what John 3, 16 says? He gave his only, his only begotten son. And so we see here, brothers and sisters, God has given to us everything so that we can have power through the sin. Also, he wants to save us from the presence of sin. In the book of Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. Romans chapter 16, and we're going to take the 20th verse. It says, and the God of peace, ha, huh, ah, this is good news, brothers and sisters, and the God of peace will do what? Crush Satan on their feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This means that sin and its originator shall be put down forever. We do not have to be worried about Satan and all that he is doing because it is only for a while. But Jesus promises us that he's going to put him down forever. And in the book of Naomi reminds me that when he is destroyed, that affliction, sin will not rise up again a second time. All that we are going through in this world today, it is because of sin. Not only will he be put down forever, death also shall be destroyed. This is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26, because of sin, many of us weep, many of us mourn, we lose loved ones, people who are so near and dear to us, they have been taken away from us. All this happened because of sin. It is the very presence of sin that causes death. But God promises to put an end to all of this. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26, look at what he says here. The last enemy that will be destroyed is what? Is death. God will save us from the presence of sin and suffering and create a new world of righteousness for us. In this new world, there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sickness, no more death, no more separation from our loved one. But we can only get to this new world if we accept God's power of salvation and be free from our sins. Second Peter. Second Peter. Chapter three. Second Peter chapter three and verse 13. There's much more I would like to say, but in the essence of time, I don't want to do that. Second Peter chapter three and verse 13. Look at what Peter is saying here. Nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for what? New heavens and a new earth in which dwells what? Righteousness. All things will be right there. This is going to be God's final act of salvation. Death and sin will be destroyed forever. How many of us here today would like to live forever? How many of us would like to live in a world that's free from sin? where there is not all this chaos that's going around us right now, where there is so much hatred, and where everyone seems to think that he is king of all, and they control everything. I want to say to you today, my brothers and sisters, thank God he has pardoned for every man who will reach out and accept it. He will bring out the prisoners from prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. 
But we must come to God, believe on Jesus Christ, confess our sins, and take that pardon. God is not going to force anything on us. In Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 7. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 7. Look at what the prophet Isaiah says here. God is not going to force his salvation on us. When Jesus was sent to this earth, he said, look at what he was going to do. Open blind eyes to bring out prisoners from prison. Those who sit in darkness, he's going to bring them out of prison. Sin enslaves us. Jesus Christ came to set us free from our sins. We must lay hold on eternal life. Because if we don't lay hold on eternal life, we will be eternally lost. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Look at what Timothy says here. This is what we need to do as we live from day to day. Fight the what? Good fight of faith. Lay hold. It's within your reach. It is right there for you to get it. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Brother and sisters, we're in a spiritual warfare. We are fighting against the enemy. The enemy is relentless. He wants us to perish in our sin. But because God has provided for us salvation, we can escape the penalty of sin. We can escape the power of sin. We can escape the presence of sin. So my brothers and sisters today, I say to you, Pray that God will give you grace and strength to move forward to freedom. Pray that you will heed the Spirit's voice and make that leap of faith, knowing that Jesus wants to set you free. And when he sets you free, he gives to you joy unspeakable and full of glory. Won't you accept his freedom today? so that you can live in joy and peace. May God continue to bless us as we continue to study. And if you have not made that decision before it, it, it is eternally too late, lay hold on God's unchanging hand and he will save you and you will be blessed. May God continue to bless us as we continue to study his word. Thank you very much.